lots, lots one could say about Tom, much of which I hope will come out in the conversation that's going to follow. Um, but a particular note, Tom was political advisor to Christiana Figueres um, as she led uh, the UN climate conference that culminated in the Paris Climate Agreement um, and played a very special role in that journey and in the outcomes of, of Paris. Um, he's also the co-author of The Future We Choose, the book that he and Christiana have just read. Uh, I highly recommend it. Uh, one of the things, Tom, that I most appreciate about the book is that it's so personal and it is about personal action. It's about the chance to take responsibility. And if you like, look in the mirror and see, see the role that we each play. So on that note, I'm going to just open up and start with the book and say, you know, what, why did you write it? What, what's the overwhelming message that you want people to take away from this? For those who haven't seen it, there it is, The Future We Choose. Um, so Tom, over to you. Great. Here, here's the British version. We have these lovely oh. different covers around the world, but thank you for sharing that. <laughs> Lindsay, thank you so much. And it's, it's, it's a delight to be here with you and with everybody. I've known Lindsay and Leaders Quest um, from very early in my career. So I've sort of been fortunate to kind of grow in partnership with Leaders Quest over the years. And, and it's been a constant delight. So really pleased to have this other chance to have another conversation now. Um, right. So I'm going to talk about the book initially, and then we'll get into other elements of things that are interesting about this particular moment, including the pandemic, and that will all come out a bit later. And it feels important to say that at the front end, because of course that's front of everybody's minds and we'll get to that. But I'm just gonna go back for a second and talk about this book that just came out. So um, we first thought that we would write a book a couple of years ago. And the reason is that we knew even then, and it is even more evident now, that we have just entered the most consequential decade in human history. And it sounds like hyperbole to say that, but it's not. And the reason for that is that we have left climate change so late that we don't have any more opportunities to prevaricate on our responsibilities to get on top of this transition. And if we do, we will lose the opportunity to manage the climate in a way so that we have a future that is regenerative and that is livable in which we and future generations can thrive. Now that's a lot, right? To start off with something like that. And if you're like most people, when I say that, you feel this sort of slight constriction in your chest of like, oh my God, are we gonna make it? And we're at this point of incredible vulnerability and it's on us. And are we gonna be able to show up and make this transition? And people get incredibly anxious about that understandably because it's a huge amount of pressure and it's a moment that won't come again so we wrote this book primarily to help people understand how they can be powerful active participants in this unprecedented moment and how they can be powerful active participants in three ways first of all how they show up as individuals how we all show up we have sort of ignored that fact a lot in environmental issues around how we as human beings turn up and face this moment. And as a result of that, we've sort of been asked to take certain actions sometimes and we feel powerless, right? I mean, that's the thing about climate change often is we feel like the things that are inside our circle of control are so small in comparison to the scale of the challenge. And we know from psychology that what happens there is, is the brain doesn't like to be exposed to an enormous challenge it can't deal with. So it sort of slightly shuts down and doesn't really engage with the issue. What we talk about in the book is a few different mindsets, things like stubborn optimism, a kind of gritty, realistic, determined optimism that you can deliberately and actively cultivate. Now that is, requires a little bit of describing because what we're not talking about there is pretending that everything's gonna be fine or ignoring some of the key issues. But what we are saying is that we all have a choice in terms of how we show up right now. And actually at these incredibly pivotal moments, we have seen that people have stepped up and they've changed the story they've told from one of powerlessness to one of powerful engagement. And in our own experience in the Paris Agreement, what we found was that when that attitude started to change, when we started to shift from a kind of dejection and apathy and a sense that we couldn't do it to a feeling of determined, committed optimism in the face of the challenges, and we would say that optimism has sometimes been most relevant when the outlook is the darkest, that was the input to transformation, not the output. 
So a big part of the book is how we show up. We talk about stubborn optimism. We talk about radical regeneration at this time of transformation. We talk about endless abundance in a moment that feels very scarce. So we unpack all of that stuff in the book. The second part is once we talk about ourselves, how do we take responsibility for our own personal lives, right? Often there is a d discussion in climate change between is it about a systemic solution or is it about a personal solution? This has to be an everything and all of the above strategy if we're going to be successful. We can't wait for anyone else to do it. And if you've been around this space for a few years like I have, that's a cyclical conversation. People will sometimes say it's about personal action, sometimes about systemic. Both have to be true. And actually that connects to the first because what we know from psychology is that if you feel at all anxious about climate change, the best thing you can do is start taking action. And then you begin to feel more like you're a participant in what's going on rather than you're just sort of subject to these large forces that are outside of your control. Now in that, one thing I would just pick up in the book is that we say that we encourage people to think about it in a slightly different time frame, which feels strange given that we're in an emergency. But rather than looking at the next few months or the next few years, think about it in 10 years, right? So in 10 years time, our emissions need to be less than half they are today to give us any chance of being successful. That is an annualized rate of reduction of over 7%, which is in excess of anything that humanity has achieved. However, when we break that down to our personal level, everybody on this call right now can decide, my emissions, I'm gonna play my part. My emissions will be less than half they are today in 10 years time. And actually we as humans tend to underestimate what we can do in 10 years and overestimate what we can do in a year. With a bit of planning and a bit of thought and a bit of care, that's enough time. 10 years is long enough to think differently about your life and what you want to do and how you can make that transformation. And the final piece is around engaging with power. So as I said, the transformation can't happen just with ourselves, just with our own footprint. It also has to be about changing corporations, changing governments. And what we see right now on the streets is commitment to change with a verve and dedication and tenacity that we haven't seen for a generation. That's incredibly exciting and inspiring. And history tells us that if we can get to three and a half percent of a population actively engaged, historically, those movements have always gone on to be successful. So that's why we wrote the book, to help people be powerful, active participants, how to show up, how to take responsibility for what they do, and how to engage with power to take responsibility for this moment and help us be successful. Wonderful, Tom. Thank you. I, I'm going to come on in a minute and talk a little bit about what some of the solutions are that, that perhaps you're most excited about that you see out there in the world. But let's just pause and, and take a note of the year. So here we are, 2020, the start of this decisive decade, as, as many of us are calling it. And it was meant to be climate year, if you like. Yeah. Biggest year since Paris. Maybe you could say the biggest year ever. And here we are two, three months in, hijacked by a virus. Um, can you speak a little bit about, you know, there's a, there's a whole recalibrating, of course, of everybody's lives going on right now. Um, and inevitably this sort of tension between the urgent and the important. But help us make sense of the relationship between this moment, this this pandemic, this global shared experience that we're all part of, um, and the climate crisis. How do you, if you like, reconcile those two? And how can you help us think about um, the effect that, that coronavirus is having on, on the climate movement? Sure. So there's, there are huge opportunities from this. No one would wish this to have happened. But now that it has happened, we need to take advantage of those opportunities. There are also huge risks. And there are similarities and there are differences. So I kind of break down some of those different things. The biggest obvious similarity is that these are both big global problems that require big global solutions, right? And they require cooperation, deep levels of cooperation. And actually what we've seen has been quite remarkable in many ways. And you can criticize it, but we have seen governments step up. And what has happened over the last few weeks is an example of how you respond to an emergency. And there is an immediate dichotomy there between what how people have responded to the coronavirus issue and how they've responded to climate change which obviously has not been anything like as ambitious um i would also say that another lesson that's come from it is that we are as vulnerable as our most vulnerable member 
that actually we are all playing our part and we are all reliant on everybody else. And the degree of interconnection that it has exposed has been quite shocking in a way, best emphasized today by the tragic fact that the British Prime Minister is in intensive care fighting for his life, right? I mean, it, this spreads everywhere incredibly quickly. Um, the other issue, which I think is worth mentioning, is that this is acute and climate change is chronic. And so that then necessarily leads to kind of different responses. Um, and climate also is kind of more difficult to deal with in the sense that responding to it isn't the same as like a stimulus response. With climate change, with coronavirus, what we're seeing is an increasing number of cases and governments responding to that phenomena. But with climate change, the way it shows up in our lives is not how we solve it. So it shows up as increased migration, changes in crop yields, um, vector-borne diseases, changing their range, wildfires, droughts, tornadoes, floods, all these other different things. But if you're in an Australian house in the outback and a wall of flame is coming at you, your initial reaction isn't, I better vote some sensible politicians into office and start reducing my emissions. It's, I've got to get out of there. So it requires us to see deeper into the phenomena to understand what's happening. Now, in terms of the risk, I do think that there's a risk, and we're seeing some of this already, that certain commentators are looking at what's happening and the fact that we are all confined to our homes, the economic activity has largely stopped, and saying, well, this is what climate campaigners have always wanted. And when you think about climate action in the future, think about this. This is what they've been calling for. And of course, no sensible person that is trying to change the world on climate change ever wanted this. And it's entirely clear that we're not going to solve this with a virus. But I do worry that the public might begin to equate those two things, which I think is a big risk. Um, the big opportunity, of course, is how we build back. So right now, policymakers around the world are looking at monetary stimulus policy and policy changes to incentivize new types of growth in the recovery period. Those have to be fundamentally based on a green recovery that is based on jobs, that is more equitable, that enables us to build the economy of the future. Those decisions that are being taken now, as happened in the financial crisis, will shape the, decade, the, the economy for the next 10 years or so. And if the monetary policy stimulus and the new policy measures help take us further, this could enable us to make more progress on climate change in the next few years than we could have imagined. Now, that's not going to be easy. And if you look around at the world's policymakers, there are some who you would trust to make wise choices, even in an emergency, and there's a hell of a lot you wouldn't. So it is on us right now to both focus on the immediate urgent issues and also keep up the pressure where we're able to, to try to get wise decisions, particularly out of financial policymakers. So Tom, I, I want to shift a little bit and give people a chance to get to know you um, as, as a person. Um, you, I've heard you say that you took a slightly sort of winding, unusual path to your role at, at Paris, that you were supremely unqualified to, to do that role. Uh, I, I beg to differ, but, but give us a sense, a couple of things that have shaped who you are, a couple of, of insights about your own path that have, have influenced you um, and created the Tom that that is, is here with us today. Sure, so, um, so it's actually uh, my friend and colleague and co-author Christiana Figueres who said I was woefully unprepared for the job before she <laughs> gave it to me. So um, we actually, just to tell that story very briefly, we met in New York in 2013, um, uh, just a few years before Paris, and she said she was looking for somebody to come and play a very different role who didn't have this sort of historical relationship with the process who could potentially see things differently. And we spent a day walking in New York and talking about what was required at the end of which she said, it's clear to me you have none of the skills and experience for this job, but I think you'd be great, let's do it. So that was my kind of first sense of working with her intuitively, which has been amazing and instructive and incredibly valuable. So I had a very peculiar um, early life. And I think that um, the thing that I would point to would be a, a few things. I had always wanted to live in a monastery as a child. And um, I grew up the son of a petroleum geologist. I travel around the world looking for oil. And that kind of instilled a sense of environment and energy in me. But then after my undergraduate, I went and lived in a monastery in Southeast Asia. And I spent a few years there living in a forest monastery um, where you spend a lot of time in individual isolation. And I think that if I took anything from that that has been helpful to me, because of course, family life, work life, that those years feel a long way away from me most of the time. Um, it is a, a tiny chink of light between phenomena and reaction. And as I think most of us know, 
what happens to you is kind of part of the story and then it can happen so quickly but the reaction can feel like it's connected to the phenomena but if you if you have enough time to sit with that and reflect on that it becomes evident that it's not that there's a little chink of light in there and then you make a choice and so my ability to leverage that changes um but that's been i think the most helpful thing that i've taken with me in my life and i'll always be grateful for the sort of series of circumstances that led me to spend time with so much space as mm -hmm. as a young as a younger man um yeah, I still consider myself to be on temporary leave from the monastery and one day, subject <laughs> to my wife's permission, I'll go back. <laughs> Wonderful. I mean, you do, you do strike me, Tom, as a stubborn optimist, to use the language for, from the book. And, and, you know, one of your qualities, I think, is you're a very, very cheerful, positive person. And, of course, we all do have our maybe darker moments and times when we wonder whether we're going to be successful, especially working on something as big and significant as, as climate change. Um, we, we, I know a number of people working in that space who struggle with, with mental well-being, with a sense of overwhelm, uh, perhaps all of us do at times. Um, and in fact, you know, people talk about depression associated with, with working in, in climate change. A any particular sort of thoughts or guidance for people on how you've learned to manage your own state? Do you have low moments on this topic? And, and how, do you, how do you kind of ground yourself back when that happens? Yeah, no, and, and of course I do. And, you know, then there's, there's a large part of me that is, and is deeply alarmed by, of course, by what's happening. And I feel very close to that. And it's hard. It is hard to see what's going on. And it's very painful. And I think you have to go through periods in which you're really aware of that and you really face that grief and kind of feeling that in our bones is not wrong, right? To feel grief, um, that's not a bad thing. It's really desperately sad what's happening and it's sort of part of the problem is that we haven't felt that up until now so i think allowing ourselves to feel that is really important um the second thing i would say and i think that um you know others have talked much more cogently than i would about this but i think it's fundamental even though it sounds very basic is i think we've become really bad at knowing when we're exhausted hmm. and i think that actually finding a way to alert ourselves to the fact that we're exhausted and find a way to just get basic levels of rest is much more connected to how we feel and how we show up and levels of depression than we think it is. It sounds basic, but actually it can really be fundamental. And the other thing, and I think this is the piece which has been, um, that has sort of stayed with me the most is real failure is possible now, right? And real success is possible as well. And that makes this the most exciting time to be alive. I mean, if you want to live a meaningful life and have an impact on other people and on the future of the world and improve things, there could not be a better time to be alive than right now. And I find that endlessly motivating, that fact, and how precious these days are before we have gone conclusively down one path or the other. We have not conclusively messed up the climate yet. We can still make it right, but we haven't conclusively taken the steps to ensure that we will. So these days are so precious and looking back from the future to this moment really gives me a lot of energy to do everything I can on a daily basis. Great, great. Yeah. Just before we move to questions, one last question from me, Tom. Get, share a couple of the things that you see happening in the wider world that make you feel we are really making progress in some cases exponentially in ways that, that we may not you know, be fully cognizant of. How, sure. how, are we, how are we moving forward? Um, so I'd say there's three different areas that I'd point to in there. And, you know, and then they're sort of equivalent to how we make progress on these, on these big issues. None of them is policy. Um, <laughs> you might not be surprised to know, but that could change. You know, policy is cyclical and we'll see what happens this year. Um, American friends might lead in with that. Mm -hmm. um, so one is technology. I mean, you know, if you have your finger on the pulse of what's happening on climate change technology, it is incredibly exciting. Right. I mean, you know, new wind and solar, wind and solar are now cheaper even than existing fossil fuel generating capacity in most parts of the world. And that is rapidly transforming the way grids work. Storage is, is quickly accelerating in a manner that we didn't even think two to three years ago would be possible. Electric vehicles are doubling every 18 months. And as our friend Nigel Topping quickly reminds us, if we were better at exponential maths, we'd know what doubling every 18 months really means. And it means that within five or six years, 
it's game over, right? Because you look at these small one, two percent numbers and you think, God, it's going to take a long time to improve. If it doubles every 18 months, just within, you know, a very short space of time, the entire infrastructure window has changed. Um, I think so. So the technology piece and that goes from the, the technology itself all the way through to the financial financial technology. We're now also seeing major infrastructure investors being very creative about the way private equity works, around the way they relate to particular projects, to crowding capital, to take these things to scale. So that is a very exciting area that I spend a lot of time thinking about. I mean, the movement stuff has been amazing, right? It's hard to remember that it's less than 18 months since Greta gave her first speech at the UN. Mm. You know? And it's a different world. It really is. Young people have stepped up to keep the put the pressure up and been incredibly smart strategically to keep it there and that sort of you know sends the chills down the back of your neck when you hear Greta speak is part of the issue and it's waking people up to it it can't end there we then need to move to action and it's still our responsibility to do it not theirs but the movement piece has been really inspiring I think and then well, the other oh, no, yeah. go, go for it All right, and then just the, the other piece actually comes from this coronavirus experience um and it is, uh, you know, we're all confined to our houses and this sort of feels a bit unconnected to climate change, but I think it's partly how we show up. I think the internet has become what we always hoped it would be in this crisis. You know, it's become somewhere that people connect and people meet and they share creativity and they share humanity. And it's gone from being this sort of angry place where people yell at each other about politics to actually somewhere that people bring their humanity. And I think that really shows that we're capable of showing, showing up in a positive way in the crisis. Thank you very much, Tom. I'm going to ask Beth to just collect three or four questions, Beth. You, I don't know whether you've got people's hands up or you need to remind people, but let's, let's hear from three or four people and bundle those up and, and then get some replies. Over to you, Beth. Great. So if you'd um, like to ask a question, I'll um, take some of those. Just um, raise your hand so you can click on the participants icon um, and then you'll see the participants screen and there will be a, a raise hand button on the right. So just raise your hand and I'll unmute you. Okay, we have um, Manas. Great. Uh, thank you. Uh, There's a great, great talk. Thank you. Uh, so two questions, if I may. One is, uh, you know, there are people and communities and countries that may actually benefit from climate change in the long term uh, and industries. And is that part of the reason why we see slow action? Uh, because they are resisting it either actively or behind the scenes. Uh, second is, would you recommend a policy of all young people spending two years at a monastery instead of <laughs> military service by all countries? <laughs> and that's a serious question. Yeah. Manas, where are you? Where, just, Tom, I'm going to collect two or three questions first before yeah. you reply. Manas, where are you phoning in from? Uh, I'm in Mumbai. Great. Lovely to hear. Yeah. Um, and Manas, that was also a great example of just really nice, concise questions. So uh, a good model for, for all our questions here. Um, so next, uh, let's take Jennifer and tell us where you're calling in from and your question. Great. Hi, everyone. I'm Jennifer Gerholt, Head of Corporate Engagement with the Women Business Coalition, Secretariat based in wild and wonderful West Virginia. Uh, thanks, Tom and Lindsay, for the discussion so far. Um, really, really appreciate it. Um, my question is, um, in your views, how do you think is the best way to speak to businesses and policymakers during this time of the COVID crisis? The climate crisis is still front and center. There's not a vaccine for it either, as Joel McCower from GreenBiz pointed out. And so, how do we best continue the momentum of talking to businesses and governments about taking climate action and really embedding it in the heart of things that businesses can continue to do as well as governments continue to do? Just want to kind of get your sense of um, how you think we can still be effective in moving the agenda forward in light of this crisis. Great, Beth, Thanks. should we get one more? Yeah, are there, does anyone else want to raise their hand or maybe we can respond to these and then if a couple hand raises come, we can take another round. Oh, wait, we have one more from Fiona. Great. Fiona, go ahead. Oh, Sorry. Yes, hi, Tom and everyone. Thank you so much. That's really, really 
thought provoking so far. I was wondering, thinking ahead, uh, daring to think ahead out of this coronavirus crisis, how do you see the climate movement, if I can put it like that, and, and the kinds of narratives that will be really helpful when we come into this kind of, let's hope, recovery stage? Where can climate kind of build on, on our humanity, as you say, Tom, and our very big collective experience of, you know, lockdown or staying at home? Thanks. Fiona, where are you calling from? I'm calling from Cambridge, UK. Great. Uh, but I normally live in Kenya. Great. Lindsay, Talk can we take just Hello. one more? Oh, one more. Okay. Yeah, one can more. I ask so, um, Felix, tell us where you're Excuse calling me. from and your question. Hi, Tom. I'm, I'm in North Carolina. Hi, Felix. Hey, Felix, how are you? I uh, love you, Guy. So, um, so I've been doing a bit of thinking about this uh, issue um, um, myself. You may have seen the article I did uh, calling for the summit to be postponed and adding a prep comment. But the, um, the issue that it seems to me is that the, the movement has to move into a different role and actually has to become much more focused at helping to deliver the targets. So I use as an example the American uh, movement where they're trying to deliver the business and local authorities trying to deliver the uh, the climate target irrespective of the president but it seems to me that we need a similar movement not just ones that are on the street but actually a real movement of uh, those that are potentially going to help us deliver it in each country because if the governments fail, as they may do in a number of other places, then we have to play a role ourselves. And that may make the difference, if everyone does it, between 1.5 and 2 degrees. So a question. Do you have a question, Felix? I'm asking whether we should... I, I thought it was... I'm asking whether I'm we should not set up equivalent bodies to what's happened in America to try and deliver the target, irrespective of government action. Great. Got it. Thank you. Tom, over to you to try to do justice to all those questions. Okay, I'll try. Um, so, um, Manus, uh, in terms of your question, so I think that um, I don't know whether um, it's possible to comprehensively say precisely which corporations and companies will benefit from climate action because it's such a varied thing and it's so multifaceted. But certainly there are some industries who feel they will be impacted badly by it. And corporate capture of democratic systems has been a major reason why that has been slowed. Absolutely. So, um, and I think that's now becoming more and more evident. And, but you know, honestly, there is, as we've seen, there is real anger towards that now. And I think that they are understanding that that is not a sort of acceptable way to carry on. So that's that's good that that seems to be changing now. But it has been historically a massive problem, and I'm not pretending it's gone away. Um, but exposing it and demonstrating what's happening is really important. Um, I, so in, in Thailand, there is a word for a young man who has not spent at least a year as a monk, and it literally translates into unripe. And actually, it is traditional there that particularly young men would spend time living in a monastery. Obviously, I think it would be an amazing way to change the world. If you have ideas about how to make it happen, I'd love to hear of them. Um, from, to Jennifer's point, I mean, I think this, the best way to speak to business and policymakers about climate action I do think that there's a really critical issue here about moment, right? Because we do need to make sure that we give sufficient space and time while this crisis is in this incredibly acute face phase. People are facing huge personal loss. Um, and there are those who would be willing to say that we are trying to take advantage of this situation. So I think that we need to choose our timing and our moment really well. I think at the moment, part of our task is some of the deep thinking around what does the building back properly look like so that we're ready because it will only be a matter of a few weeks until hopefully we have come through the worst of this immediate crisis and we can begin to have more structured conversations about there'll be huge conversations about new policy measures fiscal policy measures etc we need to really be ready for those conversations and to be arming our colleagues and our friends in the business community to have meaningful conversations with policymakers. so i think that's the work of right now. Um, in terms of your question, Fiona, about um, the climate movement and the narratives based on our collective experience here, 
it's it's a really good question and i've i've been thinking about that i mean i think that on one level um since paris we have kind of collectively felt like we failed in the idea that we can come together and do big things together and i think that the you know we have we have habituated this idea of feeling powerless in the face of big challenges multilateral diplomacy is a bit less trendy than it was in 2015 there's a lot more talk of walls going up and other different things whereas now there has been this evident demonstration of interconnectivity and the importance of that so i think there's somewhat something in that to rebuild from i don't know what that looks like but i think it's exactly the right question to ask at the moment and to try and figure out how that narrative evolves um and then felix i i nice to nice to hear from you i hope you're doing well um i completely agree and i actually think that goes into the negotiations themselves so i mean we we knew when the cop was going to be before the new president took office that at minimum trump would not increase national commitments we know bolsonaro will not in brazil we know that australia will not so already it was not looking possible to get the climate negotiations on track to where we need them to be from climate now that it's been delayed it's possible we'll have a new us administration but let's see but i think the best outcome from that and also the subsequent implementation steps is much more of a grand alliance between national governments and corporations and cities and states and investors and individuals that can come together to collectively solve these problems because it's clear that even if we have these sort of cyclical steps where governments can go further and faster they can't keep carrying the implementation torch when there's these you know cycles of political parties coming in and out of office but the good news story out of the US as you've pointed out is that even though Trump indicated he's going to pull out we still see the US in with a fighting chance of meeting its Paris commitments because of the leadership of all the other actors. So I think recognizing that in some way either through local institutions that facilitate that type of in, that type of action and the investment associated with it or even being rolled up into an international agreement. I don't know what the parameters of that would be. I think that's definitely what comes next. Um, one, one thing I want to pick up from Manus's question, I, what I also heard him ask was, you know, are there some countries or regions that perceive themselves to be net gainers from climate change? Uh, um, it's something you hear said sometimes. I presume you'd argue that that is actually just a complete fallacy. But, but would you just comment on that? You know, places that... that maybe yeah, yeah. So are they going to end up better off as the climate warms and, and so forth? I, I think most places understand that the interconnected nature of the risks means that even if there are some benefits, the destabilization of the world will make it extremely difficult for them to anticipate that it will be consistently in their favor. I think the one notable exception to that potentially is Russia, which I think has sort of been a, a law unto itself in a way. And I think that the evidence that we've seen is that Putin has assumed that Russia will be fine and that they'll have vast areas of additional farmland. I don't know how much data that's based on. Right, great. Beth, is there one final question you want to call upon? Or if not, I've got a couple of things I'm going to go back to Tom on. Yeah, we have um, one more question from Stephen. So um, Stephen, go ahead and share where you're from and your question. Yes, hello. Thank you very much, Lindsay. Thank you very much, Tom. And uh, I'm very happy being in this call. Uh, I'm the chair of the European Climate Foundation. And uh, Tom, it would be nice to meet uh, outside of this meeting maybe it sometime. Would. And, it would. and uh, obviously, we were very engaged in the COP26 preparation together with Claire Perry and now with Ashok Sharma, the, the, the new minister. Obviously, we are very pleased that it's now being postponed to next year because we were very fearful that countries were not being ready and could not be sort of organizing themselves. And uh, we hope, obviously, we work to it that we get a better, uh, a better result next year when the uh, conference will take place. Uh, my question goes in the direction of the new Green Deal that was uh, is announced by uh, the European uh, uh, Commission. European, uh, and uh, I think uh, we are very supportive of this. But maybe you you have a view on on this activity, and maybe you can share some of that. Yeah, so I, um, as in terms of a policy, I, I confess I have not analysed the parameters of the policy. I mean, I've looked at it to the extent that it seems to contain large amount of infrastructure spending, to some degree, a sort of change in how 
um, capital can be deployed to facilitate a different type of infrastructure. I think that's all good. I think it contains elements of a just transition, which from my assessment, um, felt like they had the potential to unblock some of the log jams inside the commission, particularly associated with Poland, um, and that they had top line targets that while not as ambitious as some people might like them to be, were certainly improvements. So I don't feel like I have a kind of comprehensive, thoughtful analysis of how it would work from a member state perspective. I really wish we were still in it. So I know that. Um, but um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe, maybe you know more than I do. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. I, I want to sort of end just by commenting on here we all are. I'm looking at lots of faces here with everybody's backdrop sitting in their living room, bedroom, study, wherever you may be, um, as we're all kind of confined to this homeworking. For those of you who saw me jump up, it was because one of my children came in very noisily banging and crashing and I went to kind of head him off at the door. Um, in that spirit, um, Tom, you and your wife, Natasha, have got two children, Zoe and Arthur, I think eight and six. Um, and I know as you've moved around the world at different points, you've chosen to homeschool. Um, there will be people on the line right now who, who didn't think they would ever be doing homeschooling, but are, are currently struggling with that or maybe thriving with it. Um, if you had a couple of thoughts for people um, about what you've learned, I don't know whether it's best practice or, or mistakes to avoid um, for those folk with their kids at home, trying to work out how to school them and maybe also with the kind of climate planet you know shared story how you engage your children in in that journey in a positive way i think people would love to hear sure so um so i am not an expert in education right <laughs> so i should absolutely make that clear off the bat and if you ask my children this question i have no idea what they would say in terms of how it's gone for them but Absolutely. I mean, we homeschooled our kids, most of their, I mean, they're still young, right? But most of their young childhood and we traveled around and we, we did different things. Now, so I don't have any experience of homeschooling older children, um, but they have also been in school. So I've seen the difference between the two. The only piece of, of advice that I ha would have for anyone homeschooling their kids right now is not to try and teach them anything. And that sounds kind of insane, but the thing that I have discovered is that if you leave them alone for a while, then these natural instincts and curiosities do bubble up really quickly. And then you end up with a project or, a, or something uh, that comes out of the boredom and then you have a direction and you go in that direction and then you have momentum and you can then really do something. That whole thing of sitting them down and trying to go through worksheets and stuff like that, I, I just feel like at this point in time, there is other things we can be doing with our, our cultivating our relationships with our children, letting them get bored, letting them kind of break things and find out and then finding a way to work back in how you identify those projects and get meaning out of that. You know, our kids are all so overscheduled so much of the time in certain parts of the world, not everywhere. Now's a chance for them to take a breath too. And I think it's nice to, to do that where we can. Can you give us an example? What's one of the best projects in your household? Well, so, I mean, we've, we've had, we've sort of traveled around the place and um, my daughter uh, has always been very interested in evolution. Um, I don't know where that came from. And so I took her down just before um, a couple of months ago to Lyme Regis to the Jurassic coast in the UK. And um, we were sort of banging around in the cliffs looking for fossils and things and found them all and had a brilliant time. And then we went back to the, the town there and we found the grave of this woman, Mary Anning. And Mary Anning was a famous fossil hunter. Um, and she, my daughter Zoe was really animated about it because she didn't get any of the credit and some man took the credit. So she was outraged with this woman <laughs> from the 1850s who hadn't been given her due, due cause. But then we found her grave and, um, and we saw that she had died in the mid 1800s. And this blew my mind. My daughter said, well, she died before Darwin what did she think she was finding? And so we had this moment where the connection of an organizing principle of an idea had provided meaning to the search for fossils. And she, this woman had been found finding fossils before that organizing idea existed. So we kind of went through that organizing idea principle and it's been transformative for her in terms of how ideas change the world. Lovely, lovely, Tom. Thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure to be with you. Um, I can see different faces nodding. I really, really appreciate the start of the day or the middle of the day or the end of the day that 
that you've given to everybody. I, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Um, we'd love your feedback. Go to hashtag leaders link. Please share. Please, please follow us. Please uh, pass on the message about our weekly calls. Uh, we have a call next week, same time, same place, uh, with two wonderful friends from India, actually from Mumbai, where Manas is from, who are going to talk to us about the work of Coro. Some of you know Coro, grassroots leaders networks, um, particularly at this time, as they respond, I think, remarkably positively and with incredible energy to the coronavirus crisis. So please join us. Uh, I'll be talking to Lewis Miranda and Sujata Kandahar at the same time uh, on Tuesday, the 14th of April. We've also running some free um, online uh, recharge sessions, thinking about energy, how we manage our personal energy at the best of times, as well as at some more challenging times. You can go to the website if you want to sign up for one of those sessions. Um, and all that remains is to say another thank you to Tom. Thank you to Beth for helping with the session and to wish everybody a great rest of the day and a very positive April. Stay healthy, stay well, take care of your families um, and make the most in, in the best way that we can of this kind of different time that we're all living through. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, bye. Bye-bye.